Hi, this is John Kanopoulos here from Athens, Greece. This year's ESCRS did not take place in Amsterdam. It was a virtual meeting, and I'm very pleased and honored to share with you one of the key controversies, how do we treat progressive keratoconus, cross-linking with the partial topography guided PRK, the Athens Protocol, together or sequential. This is the session chaired by Thomas Conan and BJ Dupes. This is me preparing for my presentation. And Dr. Nattis from New York uh, presented our initial introduced technique, uh, doing cross-linking first and uh, then following with a topo-guided PRK. This is us from Athens, Greece, the old uh, city, the new uh, lighting on the Parthenon. This is my actual work lab. And this is my uh, personal crew, Alexander, Angelina, and Constantine. Let's go. For simultaneous procedures. So we'll switch to the live speaker. Okay, this is John Kanopoulos. Thank you so much for listening to this talk. Uh, this talk uh, encompasses the work of almost 20 years, whether cross-linking alone uh, is enough in treating uh, uh, progressive keratoconus and uh, that we actually need to also perform a partial refraction uh, customized, topo-guided in this talk, normalization along with cross-linking. Uh, these are my financial disclosures, and I do consult for several companies of which products I will discuss, but none with this technique. Now, uh, we presented last year at the um, uh, ESRS in uh, Paris uh, the advanced normalization techniques uh, to treat regular corneas and keratoconus, and this is the first slide from that presentation. And uh, also, uh, just a few months before that, we presented the 10 year outcomes of progressive keratoconus management with the Athens Protocol. This is what we named our uh, introduction of combined partial and refer so this is the accuracy of this correction. You can see that there is a over 10 dot flattening. It's exactly where the cone should be, uh, which is a testament of how accurate the delivery of the laser is from the topographic data register um, obvious. Now, cross-linking can be combined with other things as well, such as uh, intracornea ring segments, uh, collagen shrinkage has been described, uh, fake contractor lens, uh, we've introduced also Fento Pocket as a means to conduct cross-linking. Uh, we've introduced it as prophylaxis for LASIK, and it has been used for infectious keratitis as well. Uh, and this is our uh, landmark paper uh, over uh, 13 years ago in the Journal of Cornea. You can see it's a busy slide, but this is a before and after uh, the benefit, which is uh, image C. And uh, the patient still uh, required a rigid gas permeable contact lenses to function uh, with spectacle the division was 2080 and the patient was incapacitated. And in our country being in Southern Europe, having a lot of sand and particles in the atmosphere, uh, RGP lenses are almost impossible to wear. It's a rarity that somebody can tolerate them. So between doing a transplant or Proceeding with the Athens protocol, we chose the second, and this is where the procedure was born. You can see the treatment plan on, on image D, the uh, uh, post-op image on the, uh, uh, image E, and the difference that the treatment accomplished on image F, uh, and the other eye on the bottom has uh, progressed. So this was the landmark paper. Now, how do we do? Uh, the procedure, this is also very important. We don't treat every patient that looks like they have keratoconus. We try to image the family as well. We presented at the ACRS that there's a very strong family predilection, almost 100%. Uh, we want to make sure what the residual stroma is, and we use other means besides science loop tomography, such as uh, OCT. Uh, we want to make sure uh, how well the patient is functioning with this disease, whether they tolerate contact lenses, whether they tolerate RGPs. Um, and then uh, we have to uh, discuss with the patients and ideally the family, these are usually younger adults, well, that this is not an epitropia achieving procedure at all times. This is a therapeutic procedure to improve visual function, something that most commonly has to be done with spectacular contact lenses afterwards. And this is very important because even if you do this preoperatively, most patients perceive today in 2020 an ophthalmological procedure as a procedure that it will help them get rid of the glasses. And this 
is a, a uh, belief that we have to make sure that we uh, uh, we explain well to the patients and the, and the family. And of course, treating the ocular surface the first few months is also very crucial, but this is not an average PRK that itself can be challenging sometimes, combining higher fluence cross thinking with the PRK creates a little bit of an interior segment uh, management uh, a challenge, I want to say, I don't want to say difficulty. And I think we've reported the largest body of keratoconics patients ever in the literature, over 1,000 eyes, um, studied very carefully in all their parameters. Uh, this is an example uh, of uh, the uh, procedure. Uh, how do we do the procedure? We first uh, ablate the partial refraction, topography guided ablation on the epithelium. You can see it's the top left side. Then we perform the PTK that accounts for epithelial removal. So we use epithelium as a masking agent. And the reason we right, reverse the sequence, it may sound a little bit bizarre, is because we want the higher accuracy that the very sensitive topographic procedure will have initially in delivering uh, the uh, ablation at the exact spot. The PTK to remove epithelium is not that sensitive. It, it's actually not sensitive at all to uh, cycle rotation and then myomycin C0.02% 30 seconds and the higher fluence cross thinking six milliwatts we went up, down. This is our gold standard. These are, uh, this is a report from 2009 all the way back. And I think this slide alone is a testament why the we guided ablation to be able to rehabilitate the patients. And on the uh, uh, right is the combined procedure. The combined procedure surpassed all the numbers study, meaning best corrective visual acuity, uh, residual haze, uh, residual cornea thickness, and it is counterintuitive to strengthen the cornea and then go back later if needed and remove some of the best cornea that you have strengthened in the surface in order to attain anormalization. So combining the two for us is a no-brainer. We proved it, we published it many, many years ago, and it itself had signal has signaled using uh, topography modified refractions even in virgin eyes. But uh, let's go uh, look at some clinical examples again, just like I showed in the beginning here, the difference as we're seeing on the right image is over 10 diopters. And you cannot accomplish this with cross thinking alone. You cannot accomplish this with laser alone. It's the combination of the two that creates the synergy. Of course, the synergy is not 100% predictable. We may get a six diopter, seven diopter flattening from the steepest part of the cone, we may get a 15 diopter flattening. So thus, we have to be very careful with this. These are the 10 year data we presented uh, two years ago. This has been published since. And as you can see here, the key thing, looking at this very busy table, is that our one year results are pretty much the 10 year results as well. So one can say with certainty that with combining the two procedures, uh, at one year, you can basically see what the end result will be. But of course, long-term follow-up is very important. You can see also here very uh, graphically how the uh, flattening uh, is dramatically improved at one year, and it's in excess the first three months, and then remains stable. But with a trend for a little bit more flattening, this is an example uh, case uh, top before, uh, next to it after, and how the years that followed it demonstrated a little bit more flattening as the cornea remodeled and the end result of 13 doctors flattening. This is a result here, and we reported this in our 10 year data. This is under 1% of the cases, but some become over flattened. The flattening here is close to uh, 16 doctors. And of course, this is not uh, expected. It's an unexpected, not corrected with uh, glasses, contact lenses, or our GPs. We can do a hyperopic laser and reverse the extreme flattening and still have a very factual cornea and avoid the cornea transplantation. Now, as far as pediatric CXL, because some of these patients are recognized at 12, 11, we treated an 11 year old uh, uh, within this last year, just before before the uh, uh, COVID uh, quarantine. We reported this uh, at the SRS at the Academy in 17. The results are very similar. You can see these graphs are almost similar with the 10 year results in adult patients. So, and we found that uh, uh, in uh, this uh, the pediatric group, the results are also very promising. Of course, it's more challenging performing a, a uh, probably guided PRK in a 13 or 12 year old patient, and that has its own uh, difficulties. But uh, 
if it was my child, I would certainly uh, choose the combination technique, taking that it, the proper consent was given and information uh, to the parents uh, for this. Now, uh, again, uh, some of the results, this is the evolution of uh, now not using standard pattern CXL, but a customized pattern CXL. This is the mosaic device by Avidro. And you can see on the bottom right that we're designing a multi um, scheme uh, in, as far as power and shape uh, cross linking the center oblique trapezoid will receive will receive 17 uh, actually i'm sorry 15 joules of energy the outer one 10 joules and the red circle will receive the standard five joules of energy with address and protocol the reason for this is to attain an extra refractive effect and in this case we used uh, a very uh, slight uh, uh, laser ablation, but this customized cross thinking was able to add to the refractive effect. And this is an uh, evolution of our Athens protocol. And last, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, using a fascinating technology in virgin myopic eyes, but how we adapted this technology in performing Athens protocol cases. Ray tracing has been an idea uh, many years out how to customize an ablation using simultaneously wafer data, topo tomographic data, and actually measurement data. And ray tracing, that we, uh, we were the first center uh, working with this back in the uh, fall of 2019, basically constructs a model eye from the interferometry parameters measured for each patient's each eye, not the gold uh, standard eye that's used for all laser procedures. And then it uses ray tracing from wavefront from the retina uh, forward and uh, from the cyclic device towards the eye, both meet at the anterior surface of the lens. 2000 rays studied artificial intelligence comes in and gives us the key refraction and the tilt between the lens and the cornea. Where, well, this is well where the secret holds for keratoconus because the difference when you ray trace these eyes with the artificial intelligence of the end device offered by Alcon, in essence, the keratoconic cornea is measured by the device as a cornea that's tilted. So it, most of the irregularity in keratoconus here is not treated as with topography and normalizing the cornea, but it's normalizing the theoretical tilt of the cornea to the lens of the eye. And what is the benefit? A much smaller ablative cost to the patient. You can see on the top of these figures, a double guided approach for the same patient on the bottom, uh, a ray tracing, with innovise artificial intelligence approach. And you can see that there's very little laser performed at the peak of the cone. Most of it is the, the hyperopic arch purely. And we are reporting our first cases with this. This is an example case before and after. And how with removing now very little tissue, 20, 30 microns, we get a similar result. Uh, this is the uh, algorithm behind ray tracing. I think uh, it's too complicated to discuss in this short uh, presentation. Uh, we do have complication with uh, the Athens protocol, delayed epithelial healing, but this holds true with cross thinking alone. There may be a tear scarring, again, a complication that is shared with cross thinking alone. We get over flattening of the cornea, more rare with cross thinking alone. Um, the key thing is to have good delivery of the ablation because you can have a mismatch of the measure to deliver, and this is where your laser uh, takes place. We even studied the psychometric quality of life improvement. It's dramatic. This has been published as well. And I want to close with uh, underlining that I'm convinced, I think it's a lost opportunity for any young patient who has progressive keratoconus not to perform a partial and refraction 10, 20 microns ablation because it, it has a dramatic effect in normalizing the cornea and offering much higher level of visual function. Uh, the alternatives, of course, are doing six alone, maybe entertaining a laser ablation later, RGPs, intracoronary ring segments, lamella keratoplasty, and penetrating. Uh, and knowing that crossing alone achieves one to three doctors of cornea flattening. Uh, and patients, especially those that are contact lens intolerant, I think it's a one way street. We have to entertain the possibility of performing the Athens protocol. And I know that a lot of colleagues are using a customized laser ablation and cross thinking. They try to name it something else. That's okay. Uh, we're not selfish. It is the Athens protocol. We introduced it, but I think the essence here is that we're offering to our patients the best possible solution. Uh, and uh, I urge you to at least consider it 
because this is for the benefit of our patients. And uh, I thank you so much for uh, uh, following me with me this day. Thank you so much. Next speaker. And we're going live now. Thank you, Jen. We're going to go right to Alana now. This is going to talk to us about sequential cross linking and surface linking. Thank you so much for having me here today. I'm a cornea cataract and refractive surgeon in New York. And what we'll be talking about is PRK and cross-linking for keratoconus. I'll be arguing the pro-sequential technique. My financial disclosures are below and are relevant to this talk. Excellent talks. And I think one thing if both speakers seem to agree on is, is that there's a passion for trying to improve the visual experience of these patients even though our primary goal may be to, to, to uh, stop the that progression is progressive condition. John, you've been a pioneer in this area. So the, you know, the question is, arises, the two different philosophies that we heard, one is, why would we treat a moving target? Why don't we wait, let the results settle, and then go back and treat with a more precise refractive procedure uh, once we know we're, we're approaching stability? I guess the question to both of you would be, um, at what point are we trading the short-term stability for the long-term risk of destabilizing a cornea that was cross-linked first. And clearly we don't have the answer yet. We don't have extremely long-term follow-up, but um, I'd be interested in hearing both of your thoughts on, on that question, the importance of residual bed thickness, um, how well that applies to this situation. Um, I'm just gonna open it back to you. Maybe I'll start with you, John. Yes, thank you, BJ. And, and thanks for allowing me to uh, participate in this great debate. And also I wanna thank my uh, uh, co-debater of putting up a very good presentation. Um, several issues here, and I think you're, you're hitting it right on the head, uh, VJ. We obviously have shown by comparing the sequential approach to the combined that there's two major disadvantages of going sequential. One is that if you come back to laser, number one, there is no nomogram in lasering a cross link cornea. Plus, we have to keep in mind, the cornea is not uniform, and you have been a pioneer in showing this, the cornea is not uniformly cross-linked. So everything that we know about ablation and cornea tissue does not hold true for a keratoconic eye that has been cross-linked. So the, the ablation is then able to maybe correct one, two diopters, maybe three diopters at best in, in cone flattening. Number two, you're taking out some of your cross-linking happens from surface going inwards. So obviously the strongest biomechanically part of the cornea that you have created with cross-linking lies in the surface of the cornea. And if you decide to go later and treat that patient, uh, you'll be taking away that effect. Uh, one thing that I want to point out that um, uh, uh, Alana mentioned was that uh, the cornea remodels and thickens if you study carefully uh, epithelial remodeling, you'll realize that in essence, the cornea does not thicken, it's just the epithelium that remodels. And it changes the traditional, very thin over the cone and thick around the cone to a more uniform epithelial distribution. And thus, we're seeing the cornea artificially thickening. For us, that's a sign of stability. Uh, seeing the, uh, the epithelium become almost equally thick over the thinnest part of the cornea. Uh, so, in summarizing why do both, I think we published the comparison sequential or both, and the advantage is that the refractive effect is overwhelmingly uh, compelling to do both. And one thing I want to underline here, and we just uh, uh, put up on YouTube a video a few days ago, is that unfortunately our message has been misconceived by a lot of clinicians as a green light to combine PRK and cross-linking keratoconic eyes. This is not what we're talking about. The ablation sometimes has a zero refractive error corrective. It's just a high uh, order aberration uh, treatment to normalize the cornea. Everybody focuses on the cone most of the work or equally important work happens away from the cone at the area of the cornea that flattens and creates that humongous step uh, and difficulty for patients to function. So I think if you're planning in a cornea that has steepened to 52, 53, to go back to normality of 44, 43, you can't do it with sequential technique. You, 
you get one or two doctors with cross-linking, then we saw very elegantly, you can get one or two, three doctors with the laser treatment. Uh, but if you want to have the full punch of your treatment, uh, combining the two can give you nine, 10, 15 doctors in some cases, so flattening. And that's tremendous rehabilitation of the patients. And I'll let's close. Give, let's yes. give the last uh, sure. words to the counterpart. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me here today, and um, it's just an honor, actually. Um, and I think that, you know, obviously the Athens Protocol has thousands more data points than we have with our sequential technique. Um, it's kind of in its infancy in the U.S., but I agree with everything you said that, you know, the cornea, it's an irregular shape, so it's going to have an irregular cross-linking. It is going to have, the epithelium is going to compensate and that is going to account for some of the thickening values that we see after cross-linking and even after PRK. But I just think, and even now, if you look at the literature, there's a lot of research going into the exact corneal biomechanics and what happens after cross-linking alone. Um, and depending on which technique you're using, I mean, in the US right now, we really just have at the off cross-linking but we're, more and more physicians are kind of branching into the epi on, or what we did in this study was actually a modified epi on treatment. So I think that while it is certainly very convenient and usually incredibly successful to perform um, the Athens protocol, um, you also do have to take into account that you do have these outlying cases where you can get a significant amount of corneal flattening over a period of six to 12 months after cross-linking. And if you do PRK at the same time, how do you know what you're really getting? And when you're trying to provide a therapeutic effect, you can actually kind of worsen the visual acuity. And I know that's not the case most of the time, but just in the, um, in the goal of trying to provide a therapeutic treatment for these patients, I think that, um, you, it's kind of safer in some ways to do cross-linking, wait, make sure that everything heals well, and then move on to the next step. With the understanding that you are doing a therapeutic treatment, you're not aiming to get these patients to 20-20 with no glasses, no contact lenses. Um, it's the same goal, it's just a different consideration. I think we're on the same team. Both techniques <laughs> work, uh, and, and of course, if somebody's timid, in, in going into the Athens protocol, I've, I see no problem in, in going sequential. I mean, that's what we did for, for years when we started, uh, uh, and I, I totally agree. And I thank you for putting up such a good discussion. Well, thank you both, um, and thanks to all our speakers for a really interesting symposium. Um, we really appreciate the work you've done to advance the science of uh, treating keratoconus. Uh, so we congratulate you both on your scientific efforts in this area. Please keep it up, we need to learn more. Can Thank we have you. the last slide? Okay, I asked the uh, M events to put it on, if this is possible. Do really uh, still hear us? Uh, it's on, it's on, isn't it? I, I cannot see it. Okay, if it's on, can you all see it? Yes, I can see it. Okay, good. So, BJ, thank you uh, for um, joining here at the ESRS from the United States. Thank you all for being here tonight um, in this, you know, very uncertain times but I think we have to move on. We do the best out of it. It was a fantastic symposium. Definitely, I learned a lot, as usually at these symposiums. It's very scientific. A lot of new information, a lot of scientific information. I hope you join us at the ESRS over the next two days, virtually, and we really, really, really hope to see you all in person in a year's time in Amsterdam again, and maybe even further earlier, I hope, BJ, in San Francisco and on the US ground, but we have to watch the situation carefully. I thank you all for joining JCRS and the symposium and the ESRS and have a good night. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you, guys. And we're offline. Thank you very much. Thank you. Wonderful thank you. session. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys.
I, I couldn't Very see that. Very much all of you, it was wonderful. Thank you, Thomas. Had great presentation, a lot of information, very nice discussion. Very, very respectful, which is always very difficult, but uh, it's very good. And we had good information and we have different views, but uh, it's so fantastic to see that we can exchange uh, ideas again. Uh, it works through virtual, not as good, I would say, I would love to see you all in, in Amsterdam at this point. And I'll have a glass of wine with you, but unfortunately that's not possible. Join the ESCRS. Uh, Rudy put up a very nice show at uh, 8 o'clock. And if you're willing to spend a little time, he would uh, love to, to see anybody joining, even virtually. So thank you all and have a nice evening. And a nice day in the U.S., of course. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. See you thank tomorrow. You. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Success.